And I'd like to call to your attention that it's a little different this morning. We're going to do it in sections. So I'll be the leader. Boys and girls, I need you to read out nice and loud so that those uh, men who follow you will know when you're through so they can come in nice and loud so that we women will know when you're through and we can all follow each other together. So if you'll follow me, please. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Kiddos, where are you? Oh, nice, and loud, nice and loud. Good job, Brennan. <laughs> Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. God's, God's majesty and glorious splendor is, is proclaimed by every generation. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. The Lord is faithful, merciful, and just. God is holy, righteous, and kind. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Men and women, children and elders, lift your voices. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. share with one another a sign of Christ's peace.
Good morning, Mr. I know! Good morning! I think she's up here repeating that for now. Well, I know we have lots of folks here for homecoming, but we do want to gather back into our pews at this time <laughs> so we can get to all the food that's across the street. Yeah, we know, he says. So as you all settle back into your pews, let me welcome you to First Presbyterian Church. Welcome home. This is the Sunday that we celebrate homecoming, and this is our spiritual home. Please join us for lunch over at Westminster Hall, Caddy Corner, across Pleasant and Lexington, immediately following worship members and visitors alike, as well as guests. There will be plenty of food, rest assured. Also today, we welcome back our chancel choir and our, yes, yes, and our praise team. And we are thrilled to have them both back, even as we anticipate our bell choir returning with an offering sometime soon. And we also give our thanks for our new uh, music director that he has gotten everybody off on such a great note. So. <laughs> Praise the Lord for Paul Smith being here among us. Well, please find the Ritual of Friendship pad and add your information, your prayer requests, and pass that along the pew for your neighbor to do likewise. And while you do that, I will highlight a few of the activities in the life of the church that are coming up. This Wednesday is the Presbyterian Women's Mystery Trip. And I know that will be an enjoyable time, and we have some new folks who are going to that, so newcomers are welcome. On Thursday, we have the first of our open table gatherings, and on Friday, the Menninger Bible Study starts back, so lots of things to look forward to. As far as our open table gathering, the one this Thursday at 1 p.m. is on the ins and outs of Medicare. So I would like everyone to think about who might be interested in such a topic and invite them to come. You can find flyers out on the credenza. There's a sign up out on the credenza. Or you can go to the church website, www.fpcindep.org, and sign up online. And uh, also share that. Uh, website and the sign up link to folks on your email list and your social media groups so that we can uh, help get this new ministry, this new offering off to a good start. The one coming up in October on the 10th is going to be on home repair resources and winterization. So these topics are things that we have thought might be a very good help to, a, a big help to the folks out in our community, and we want to help them in any way we can and show them that we care uh, about them and offer things that would be of help, help to them. 
I should also mention that our Logos ministry is starting up on October 9th, and it is not too early to register folks for Logos. So please find a registration flyer out on the credenza as well, or um, go online. I'm sure we can register online. I get a big nod of the head from our uh, Christian educator who says, yes, you can register online. Uh, any other announcements? And I know you were going to mention something, so I'll call on Bonnie this time. Wow, I didn't even raise my hand this morning. Yeah. Uh, so we have first, um, I will have more yellow, there are going to be yellow sheets for the Medicare thing, the ins and outs. On one side it has Medicare, and the other side it has a whole bunch of stuff about church information and logos and Sunday school and yada, yada, yada. I just have to go get them out of my office. But I'll have them over there. Um, Good. But my big announcement is we have some incredible, exciting news. We have a new young adult Sunday school class beginning. So excited. Yay. Yes, yes, it deserves a round of applause. So this is going to be one for young adults, young working families, because uh, we know that they're busy. There's going to be, we're going to kind of figure out as we go along how th the scheduling and how it's going to work. They might not meet every Sunday because let's face it. They're busy, <laughs> but we'll be getting lots more information. Um, if you have questions, you may email me or call me or text me. Um, my information's in the bulletin or Laura Gillette, who is also going to be helping to lead it. But if you have any questions, I would love to answer them for you. So thank you. Awesome, awesome. <laughs> New young adult group. Any other announcements? Yes, Pam. Okay, so Pam's taking last minute reservations for the Presbyterian Women Mystery Trip today. Other announcements this morning. Yes, Sarah. Your mom's back in choir. Your mom's back in choir. Yay. We are thrilled about that. We are thrilled about that. Well, is that because she's not out at the pew with you? Is that why? No, no, I'm sure it's not. Uh, as for uh, prayer requests, Ed Hatcher went into St. Luke's downtown with uh, blood pressure issues, and he's still down there, but uh, doing better. They just haven't found out why his blood pressure skyrocketed. So we need to be praying for Ed. Also, Alan Walker is at St. Luke's East after yet another procedure on his heart. They're hoping that this will be the one that does the trick. He's feeling so much better, so we are thankful for that. And then, of course, uh, prayers for those who have been devastated by Hurricane Dorian in the Bahamas and have felt the effects of those storms here in the States. We need to be remembering those folks, praying for them, and praying for those who are providing aid and support for the rebuild. Any other prayer requests this morning? Yes, Brennan. We need to be praying that your poison ivy finally goes to wet away, Brennan. I know one person in this sanctuary who can commiserate with that who will remain nameless, but somebody had another encounter with poison ivy that just is miserable, we know. So we'll be praying for that for sure. Any others this morning? Well, let's join our hearts and minds in our morning prayer. Lord God, you told us that if we do things that you say, our lives will be built on a rock. And if not, then we are on shaky ground. Knowing that, we still manage to ignore in many ways the ways that you lead us and teach us. We take those major steps of growth in our faith that could be done in the spirit of a slow and steady pace, and we wait until some crisis sends us running to you. Save us from such foolishness. Give us wisdom to accept the sure foundation you have made for us, and to maintain it and to build it up for ourselves and for those coming up in the faith behind us and around us. We pray your sure foundation and your compassionate provision upon those 
devastated by Hurricane Dorian. We pray your divine wisdom upon the doctors addressing Ed Hatcher's blood pressure issues. We are thankful that Alan Walker is free, feeling better, and we ask for this to be a permanent fix to his heart troubles. We pray that Brennan would get some relief from the poison ivy, Lord. We pray your spirit of comfort and provision for all those that we know who stand in need before you this day. We pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All right, I have to get some cool kids up here. All right, where's all my cool kids this morning? to me. All right. Well, good morning. How's everyone doing? Good. Good morning, guys. You're good. Well, I'm glad you're feeling a little better. You're feeling great. Well, that's good. If I, I have some questions because you know how much I love questions, right? I love my questions. Oh, that's a scary thought. Well, good, because I have a question. All right. Well, all right, well then let's listen to this question this morning. <laughs> My question this morning is if I say you have to earn something, what does that mean? Working toward the goal of getting it. Okay, so what are some things you have to earn in your life? Okay, some math testing stuff. What about you? Oh, hey, dude, I'm coming to your house. <laughs> Picking up duff for get a dollar. I, how about cat fur? Can I do cat fur? Okay, cool. Okay. Okay, okay, so picking up the house, okay. All right, so how, do you guys have anything that you guys have to earn? Yeah. Toys, yeah, you have to do something to earn toys sometimes. Yeah, how about you guys? Sometimes. Ah, oh, earning money to go to Disneyland, that's always a good one. Do you guys have to earn anything in your life? Oh, yeah, like what? Oh, well, how about Boy Scouts? What do you have to earn in Boy Scouts? Rank to Eagle, Eagle and you do that and you get badges and stuff like that, right? How about you, Madeline? You have to earn anything? Do what? Okay, so you go to Girl Scouts and you earn badges too. So yeah, we all have to earn things in life. But you know, there's something in life that you never ever have to earn. Anybody want to take a guess at what you never, ever have to earn? Aww. Man, we have some smart kids. What were you going to say? <laughs> life. You don't have to earn. Well, no, you don't have to earn life. You're given life. But you're also given God's love, aren't you? You don't have to earn God's love or his grace, as we call it as well. And that's pretty special. It means you don't have to work for it. Because God loves us no matter what. He loves us when we make mistakes and we say we're sorry, right? Yeah. He loves us when we go to bed. 
he loves us when we go to bed. Yeah. Pastor Day is going to use some kind of some big words this morning. And I'm going to tell you what the words are so you know what to listen for. Okay? No, I don't think it's that word, but it's something else. So, oh, I'm so glad we're all back. Okay. Okay, let me, let, me, let me tell you the three words that you guys have to listen for, and Pastor Dave's going to explain them, right? Yeah. Okay. So. <laughs> All right, if I say so. Oh, that's scary. All right, so the three words that I want you guys to listen for, and then I'm going to ask you about them after church, so be ready, is Christian, salvation, another really big fancy word, sanctification, Okay, so Christian, salvation, and sanctification. Now we're also, now we're also going to ask the adults to remember those three words as well and see if they can answer what they mean later, okay? Yeah, yeah, uh, all right, we're going to do a quiz today after church. All right, well, let's pray this morning and help us to remember that we don't have to earn God's love like we have to earn toys or money. All right, can we pray about this? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are just so grateful that you allow us the love that you give us, the grace and the love and the mercy that you show us throughout our entire life. We know we don't deserve it, but you give it to us anyways because of the love that you have for your children, and we are so grateful. Help us to keep this in mind as we hear today's message and as we go about our life and the everyday world that we live in. Now be with us as we go. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. Thank you, guys.
As you remain standing, would you please join me in the prayer of confession? Precious Jesus, friend and teacher, you bring so many wonderful people into our lives, fathers and mothers, children and youth, friends and neighbors, school teachers and church leaders. Yet do we stop to acknowledge them as blessings from God? Do we say a word of thanks or whisper a prayer of gratitude? Have we told our appreciation, written a word of encouragement, sung their praises? Faithful God, forgive us for taking anyone for granted. Give us eyes to see the miracles around us. Give us faith to trust that you care for each and every one of us. Give us hearts to lift up our thanks. Amen. When we feel distant from God, our Father God's arms are always held wide out to us, and he calls to us, children, come to me. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. reading this morning is from the first letter of John, which is clear back in the New Testament on page 234 and 235. I'm reading from verse 2, from chapter 2, verses 12 through 14, which can be found on page 234. I am writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven on account of his name. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I am writing to you, young people, because you have conquered the evil one. I write to you, children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young people, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. Our New Testament lesson this morning is 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 13 through 17, which can be found beginning on page 202 of your Pew Bibles. 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 13 through 17. Listen for the word of God. But we must always give thanks to God for you, brothers and sisters beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and through belief in the truth. For this purpose, he called you through our proclamation of the good news so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers and sisters, 
Stand firm and hold fast to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by word of mouth or by our letter. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and through grace gave us eternal comfort and good hope, comfort your hearts and strengthen them in every good work and word. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we are blessed to find you in our midst and eager to have you make yourself known to us in the stillness of prayer, in the symbols of worship, in the words and melodies and actions of proclamation. We lay aside all else but the desire to be in your presence, touched by your grace and fed by your word. Amen. How old were you when you learned about nouns and verbs and adjectives and other parts of speech? Maybe nine or 10, maybe 11 or 12 by the time you mastered the parts of speech? All right, now how many of folks here are under the age of nine? How many folks here are under the age of nine? <laughs> Bob Steichleather and a couple of up here and one over here. So I know when you're under the age of nine, you haven't maybe been exposed to some of this, but I'm gonna talk today about adjectives. Adjectives are simply words that modify or describe a noun. And a noun is a person, place, or thing. So if I say the church wedding, the word church describes the word wedding, and so church becomes an adjective or a modifier. Now, what if I say the Christian businesswoman? Well, then I've modified the word businesswoman with the word Christian. And Christian becomes an adjective or a modifier. But you know what? In a certain sense, Christian should never be used as an adjective. A Christian is a person, and so it's a noun. We should always use the word Christian as a noun instead of an adjective in a very certain sense because an adjective is often used to modify things that are bigger or more important than they are. Adjectives also can be used to limit nouns, such as in the sentence, the little man named Zacchaeus. When Christian becomes an adjective and not a noun, it becomes a label that we lay on the surface of our lives rather than the core of who we are. If I say the Christian businessman, what is more important? That he is a businessman or that he is a Christian? So we need to make sure that we use the word Christian to refer to that most important part of our lives of your life. He's a businessman, but he's also a Christian, a Christ follower. Now that really says something, doesn't it? So you see, the word Christian is really most powerful when it is used as a noun, as the core of who we are, and not some modifier for some other part of our lives or our identity. Now, as we think about being a Christian at the core of who we are, let's use the rest of our sermon time this morning to look at what makes a person a Christian in the first place. 
In the Apostle Paul's second letter to the Thessalonians, he shows us what makes a person a Christian in the first place. So you young people here, up here in the front row, you young people who are drawing and who are doing other things, you young people who are especially under the age of nine and older, and all you older people, but you young people might want to listen a little bit more carefully because this sermon is especially for you, for young Christians, and for anyone else who's young in the faith, so to speak, new Christians, even if they're older folks. And of course, the sermon is also good for mature Christians, those who are mature in the faith, faith and can look back at what it was when they first came to believe, what that was like. And those who are even older in the faith and are looking forward to ways that they can give back to those who are new to the faith or to a young person here in church. So, one of the first things that Paul does in this, his second letter to the Thessalonians is give thanks to God for them because, says Paul, God chose them as the first fruits of salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and through belief in the truth. So as Bonnie said, there's some big words there in that sentence, words like salvation. Well, salvation means being embraced by God. It's God's embrace. Salvation is really kind of God's big hug given to us, especially if we've done something wrong and feel like we don't deserve it. When you've done something wrong, God does not punish you. God embraces you, hugs you, and loves on you. That's the first thing young Christians need to remember, is that God loves you no matter what. Salvation. The second big word that Paul used in that sentence I read is sanctification. Sanctification means being made holy, pure, being made innocent again, or being made more like Jesus. Paul says that we are sanctified by the Spirit of God and through belief in the truth. Did you notice that word and in that sentence? And is a conjunction. It's the glue that holds phrases together. And in this case, connects the words Spirit of God to our belief in the truth, belief in Jesus. Sanctification, becoming more like Jesus, requires both God and us. Sanctification involves both the work of God's Spirit and our belief in Jesus Christ. As one old-time preacher explained it, sanctification involves the hand of God reaching down to us and our hand reaching back up to God to grasp his hand. When God reaches down to us, it's only those who believe in God who actually reach back up to God's hand to receive that hug of salvation. God's unconditional love, that embrace of sanctification that helps us to be more like Jesus. Now, everybody loves to be hugged, right? Especially young children. And the best person to be hugged by is often a parent. And the best parent to be hugged by is who, Sarah? Who's the best parent in the universe to be hugged by? Any parent. Any parent. Who's the biggest, best parent? Yes. Your mom. And who's a bigger, better parent than your mom who lives up in heaven? God. God is the biggest, best parent there is. And he's always reaching out to us with a hug to show us that we are loved no matter what. 
Now, the coolest thing about being a Christian is that once you claim your identity as a Christian, once you say that you believe in Jesus and really mean it, there is nothing that can separate you from the love of God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And even better news is that you don't have to do anything but accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, as the ruler of your life, as the one and only true pathway to that great big God hug that God is reaching down to us with. It's just like what Paul said at the beginning. God chose you as the first fruits of salvation, as new Christians, through, says Paul, our proclamation of the good news of Jesus Christ, that God sent Jesus into the world, that Jesus is God's only son, perfect in every way, and that Jesus sacrificed himself for our big God hug. When Paul talks about becoming Christian through our proclamation, what is he referring to? He's referring to the teaching of any Christian who helps a new believer to embrace the God hug and to follow Jesus and the church in becoming a better Christian. Each of us here has a long way to go in becoming the best Christian we can be. That's true for everybody. It's true whether you are a new Christian, a mature Christian, or a long time older Christian. Now next Sunday we're going to look at what it means to be a mature Christian. It may mean that you've been a Christian for a long time, and yet new Christians can and do show surprising spiritual maturity and wisdom. Even teaching Sunday school, right, Megan? Hi. Hi. <laughs> or even asking great questions like Sarah, our junior theologian over here. <laughs> Being a mature Christian may also mean that you're getting a little tired, a little frustrated, a little skeptical even, a little impatient when it comes to the fullness of Christ's promises. I mean, one look at the world around us, and it's no wonder anybody would be wondering, when will Jesus come and set things right again? Well, that's what we're going to look at next week, what it's like to be a mature Christian in it for the long haul. But for now, we can all be better Christians by focusing on Paul's final instruction in today's reading. Are you ready for it? Okay, here it is. After telling new Christians that God has chosen them for salvation, for that big God hug, and that God's greatest desire is to reach down to us so that we might reach up to God when he is ready to embrace us and that, Christ, that in Christ we have already been made right with God in God's eyes no matter what we might have done. After saying all this to the new Christians in Thessalonica and the new Christians here today, Paul tells them and us, quote, stand firm and hold fast to the traditions that you were taught either by us, either by word of mouth or by letter, by scripture. In other words, keep doing the things that the church teaches you to do when it comes to becoming more like Jesus. For the children and the youth, here today and others who are new to Christianity. This means going to Logos and or Sunday school and certainly to worship each Sunday. 
For those who are more mature Christians here today, it means taking on a devotional practice, studying the Bible, reading books, or watching videos by even more mature Christians. And of course, for the most mature Christians, it means leading Sunday school or a small group, mentoring a youth in the Tuxus confirmation class, being on the ministry team of Logos, and maintaining the foundations of our faith through your committee work and your service on other ministry teams, choir and all kinds of ministry teams, being a leader out in your community, being a leader who is at your workplace or in your families or among your neighbors, a leader who always puts their identity as Christians first. In other words, it means being a mother or a father, a daughter or a son, an aunt or an uncle, a boss or a coworker, or a volunteer who is always first and foremost a Christian, not perfect, but always striving to do better in God's eyes and to help others to come to know Jesus and to do the same. Amen.
Would you stand as you are able and join me in the affirmation of faith? We believe in God, whose love is ever constant and steadfast, even when we are not. We believe in Jesus the Christ, who walked among us, who was betrayed and forgave, and who died that we might live. We believe in the Holy Spirit, ever present with us to comfort as well as urge us forward in the name of Christ. We believe in the church as the place where we are loved as we are and still gently encouraged to grow. We believe that we are called to be the church, to love people more than they deserve as Christ loves us. We believe in the miracle of life and in the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. God has poured out generosity upon us without restraint, not only in the blessings of our lives, but in the blessing of Jesus Christ, whose way leads to eternal life and life abundant. Let us respond to God's love for us by giving our tithes and our offerings. We give our thanks, and as we do so, we confess that we sometimes give by rote or routine. We tend to give what we always give, guarding our wallets and our time, when instead we should be giving generously, extravagantly. We should be giving to safeguard our children, to nurture them in faith, and to safeguard our faith that it may blossom and grow. Shake us awake, O oh God, to the realization of our good fortune. To give for the future is one of life's greatest blessings. 
It is in this spirit of stewardship, generosity, and vision that we bring our gifts before you today. Amen. Sisters and brothers, stand firm in the faith and hold fast to the traditions that you have been taught. May our Lord Jesus Christ and God our Father, who loves us and gives us eternal comfort and hope, comfort your hearts and strengthen them in every good work and word. Amen. No! 